The world, the world's writers will walk through those gates, and uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. Kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. I hope you enjoy your events in this year's digital programme and that they spark in you thoughts and conversations and feelings. All the things that a good book should do and all the things that a wonderful book festival like Edinburgh International Book Festival does too. It's a book festival that's really dear to my heart. It's one of the first festivals I attended as a new author. I was part of the Outriders Africa programme and every year returning to it feels a little bit like coming back to a literary home. It's such a pleasure to see them going online this year, and I'm so excited for the future of Edinburgh International Book Festival. We were looking for novels that had a really clear and potent voice that haunted us and stayed with us. We were looking for novels that were incredibly well translated. Literature is the one art form that puts us completely in somebody else's shoes. It's the supreme act of empathy, as crucial to the survival of the human spirit as water or air. Welcome to the world in words. Hello, uh, welcome. My name is Juana Adcock and on behalf of the Edinburgh International Book Festival, I'd like to offer you a very wa warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us in this online space that we're creating in the times of COVID-19. Um, finding new ways to share our ideas about literature and stories that become even more vital during these rapidly changing times. Um, today I feel very lucky to have the chance to talk to two very um, talented women who I've admired for a very long time and who I think are both doing their first event together after working on the novel Hurricane, Hurricane Season, which I have right here. Um, and this is a novel that sings with virtuosity and venom in a linguistic torrent that documents, as one reviewer put it, the inner life of misogynistic violence for both perpetrators and victims. And I won't say too much about what the book is about because I want, to, I want you to hear that from Fernanda herself. Um, but the book is um, really kind of unusual. It, it, I don't know if you can see, um, it's, it consists of eight very, very long paragraphs or chapters. And these are really long sentences that are driving and propelling and they kind of take us on a quest to discover the stories behind one grisly event. And 
um, yeah, they're propelled by a violent lyricism and social immediacy, uh, as Chloe Aridjis said. So I'm going to read the, their bios. Fernanda Melchor was born in Veracruz in 1982 and is widely recognized as one of the most exciting new voices in Mexican literature. In 2018, she won the Penn Mexico Award for Literary and Journalistic Excellence. And in 2019, the German Anna Segers Place for the International Literature Award for Hurricane Season. Uh, Sophie Hughes, who has rendered this book masterfully in English, has translated novels by many of the best contemporary Latin American and Spanish authors, including Laia Jufresa and Rodrigo Jalpun. Her translation of Alia Trabuco Serán's The Remainder was shortlisted for the 2019 Man Booker International Prize. So just a little bit about the format for the event. We're going to talk uh, about what the book is about, the process of writing it and translating it. Fernanda is going to show us a little bit about her research process and the planning for the book, which is really fascinating. And we're also going to hear a short reading from the two of them. Um, so Fernanda, um, Hurricane Season is one of those books that are just impossible to put down. Um, reading it is absolutely addictive. Uh, the sentences are breathless and they just kind of force you to keep reading. And the events described are horrendous, yet as readers, we can't bear to look away. Um, can you tell us briefly what the book is about and what led you to writing it? Oh, well, uh, well, thank you so much for, for uh, being here, Juana. Thank you, Sophie. And, and well, this is great being, being here participating in the, in the fest. Um, well, about Hurricane Season, uh, it, I think it's one of those books that uh, you as a writer felt uh, just pressed to write. I, I, I don't know how to, how to, how to put it. Um, uh, Hurricane Season is, is a novel about a really small town in uh, rural Veracruz. Uh, uh, this is a small town, uh, impoverished and um, surrounded by uh, sugar cane fields. Uh, and the novel begins with, with the finding of, uh, of the witch of the village, the corpse of the, of the witch of the village. And the whole novel is about uh, finding sense uh, for this horrendous murder. And uh, you go chapter after chapter, uh, you go with, with different characters, inhabitants of this uh, small town, and uh, you get to know uh, the deep reasons behind this, this atrocious crime. And basically, I, I, I wrote this novel because uh, I'm a journalist too, and a few years ago, I, I read uh, in the newspaper, uh, this story, you know, uh, I read a, a small story about a village witch that has uh, had been uh, found uh, dead in a murder in a in a in a canal, and well, uh, I just uh, it just fascinated me, you know, uh, the 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 fact that the journalists, the authorities, the police, they all accepted the fact that this person was a witch and that the cause of murder was a sort of revenge and has to do with a crime of passion. And I just found fascinating that, and of course I was, I was also shocked that these things uh, still happen in, in 21st century, right? So I just got that news just, you know, in the back of my head. And, and at first I, I tried to write a nonfiction story, you know, sort of uh, in cold blood uh, from Truman, uh, by Truman Capote. And I, I wanted to go there and do research and interview the murderers and go visit them in, in, in prison, you know, the, the, whole, the whole package, the, the whole new journalist package. But uh, it was too dangerous to do that in, in that time in Mexico, you know, with, with the drug dealing violence and a, a war, a, practically a war between different cartels. Uh, and, and again, I, I also felt that uh, I didn't have any right to go there and ask questions and expect to get the truth from those questions you know, to people that I didn't even knew, you know, that I didn't even know. And I was, I just thought 
that maybe I could do a, a work of fiction and through fiction get to some kind of truth behind this 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 horrendous act and and make sense of uh, this horrible violence that seemed at that time to be to be around me all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really hard to make sense of of this violence, isn't it? Um, you know, it's kind of coming at you from from everywhere, it seems, and it, it seems to not have an origin. I remember at the time as well, reading the news from Mexico, and it was very disconcerting because we didn't know the origins of that. And I feel like you're kind of going really deep into into the actual origins of this violence and you're kind of structuring it through language in a really compact way, you know, where one sentence can tell us so much about, you know, about the entire structural oppression and, and structural violences that exist within the society. Um, can you tell us a little bit about language and why you chose to use this kind of language in in your book? I think it's one of the uh, most criticized uh, decisions or, or the most riskier one, uh, besides the form, because as you well said, uh, the novel is, is formed by it, um, uh, a little bit more than eight long, long, long paragraphs, you know, sometimes going for 64 pages without uh, a, 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 a break, and uh, that that was also a risk. But the language, I, I feel, it's it's for me, it was the most difficult task because, uh, first of all, I think I admire a lot the writers that can use popular language and and you know like this oral quality in, into their text. I, I really love. Uh, for example, uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, uh, really are difficult dialogues, you know, in this um, uh, South of America, uh, Southern dialect even, you know. And I really admire a lot of Mexican um, writers who do the same, like Jose Agustin or, or uh, Gustavo Sainz too. I mean, there's a whole tradition of uh, using the, the popular language, uh, the, the, I think the beautiful poetry that popular language has to turn it into literature. And uh, second, I, I think for me it was a, a, a moral decision, you know, because I was trying to write about the, the darkest aspects of the human heart, uh, what happens through the, uh, behind the mind of a, of a, a, a a femicide, you know, a, a feminine, a, a, a killer of women, and I was trying to make sense of uh, that the hate, the resentment, the you know, all, all these strong and difficult emotions. So I thought that the best uh, way to do that without distancing myself, you know, like a third person narrator, uh, you know, uh, using like uh, the perspective of God, you know. I just really wanted to be with the characters, inside the, the skin of the characters. And I had to use the words that the characters will use to describe their words. So, so uh, for me, it was very important to use this crude language. And third, I think um, the, the book talks about uh, misogyny. The book talks about uh, confronts, you know, misogyny, homophobia a lot of uh, uh, violence in the speech, not only violence, physical violence, you know, be, but symbolic violence. So I really wanted to put that so the reader could be confronted with, with, with all those, uh, with the, all this violence and it, kind of like a shock, you know, like, a, like in a shock, um, uh, I just, I just wanted the reader to stop uh, thinking it was natural because I think uh, I was thinking mostly in a Mexican audience and you know in Mexico is still a, a great problem racism classism uh, misogyny homophobia are still you know deep and, and 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 difficult troubles that we need to address as a society so uh, in a way I was trying to to confront the reader with these discourses that we hear all the time growing up, you know, um, and 
I wanted to put them there and, and to shock the reader and, and confront them with, with, with them. I think that's um, really interesting what you're saying about shocking the reader, but also um, I could really recognize uh, these ways of thinking and these ways of speaking um, in, the, in a way it felt quite true. And then at the same time, because I'm not from your region, I'm from the north, you're from the Gulf of Mexico, there were some places where I couldn't really understand, you know, what, what that word meant, or I'd never heard that phrase before, or so on, and, you know, it's kind of making me guess. So it feels almost like you're creating a dialect that's slightly fictional. And would you say that's the case? I will, I, I will definitely say that that's the case because um, I, I wanted to work with, you know, kind of a real, to give an effect, you know, because literature, uh, you never work with reality, you never work with, with uh, but you work with illusion, no? It's, it's a little bit like uh, cinema also, no? Tarkovsky used to say that cinema is... Uh, the, the shaping of time and, and literature is kind of the same. No, you, you need to create an illusion of reality. You need to create uh, the illusion of, uh, of a really slang popular language. So I did a sort of a mix. You know, uh, I wanted to take Mexican Spanish, definitely, and give it a, a Veracruzanian, Southeast, Central Americanish uh, flavor, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that progressively, you know. I, I just it 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 came to my mind all the or it could come to my mind all the time. Uh, for example, uh, Clock Time uh, Orange, uh, mm -hmm. how that book is constructed in a way that at first you find these weird words that uh, you begin to make sense a little bit, and then middle of the book you are already uh, reading in that uh, strange. Uh, uh, um, Slavic uh, influence uh, language, totally different from, from English. And I wanted just to do that. Uh, maybe it, it just to start subtle, because as, as being Mexican, it, it just, for, for some people, it's just it's way out uh, already uh, strange, you know, but it has a progression. And um, I wanted to do what... Uh, of, of course, with distances, uh, I, I wanted to do what Rulfo did a little bit with Mexican language also in, in works like uh, Pedro Paramo or I, I don't know how they, they translate it in English, El Llano en Llamas. I think it's the... The, the uh, Plain in uh, Flames. There's, there's several translations, but one of them is The Plain in Flames. The Plain in... Beautiful. The Plain in Flames. Well, he... You know, Rulfo was criticized at his in his moment because... Everybody said that uh, peasants from Jalisco didn't talk that way, but at, but at the same time they did. You know, he created sort of a language using the same words that, that we use every day. He created a new language. So uh, obviously, uh, with the distance guard, I, I wanted to do the, the same thing: construct a, a sort of uh, intermediate uh, Veracruzanian lingo and. Sophie could, can tell you uh, about it because there are some words that I even invented, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and, and that was that was like the the task, the the, the main task with with language also to to do a sort of a translation to give it a better Christian flavor. But I just couldn't, you know, like like trans uh, like just put words like that because we normally speak horribly, you know, like like normal people doesn't talk like literature so it's kind of a, a always a, a mediation mm. yeah and i mean i imagine sophie the task of translating this almost fictional language must have been quite a challenge especially with the long long strings of mexicanisms sometimes invented sometimes real um how did you approach the the challenge of doing this um I have to say as well, thank you for, for the invite. It's so nice to be at Edinburgh Festival in some way. And it's also, I just could listen to Fernanda talking about the novel, even though I lived with this novel for, for at least three years now, and I could just keep listening. So it's nice to be in the same virtual room. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's beautiful listening to Fernanda talk because when you, you talk about the illusion of reality that you had to create, and then I was thinking, so what did that mean I had to create? I had to create the illusion of an illusion of reality. <laughs> um, and that's what I did. And, and I'm, I'm still happy that I kind of took that approach and I feel slightly kind of vindicated in what was maybe a slightly um, unorthodox approach to this translation because it, I knew it was going to be um, published in America and in Britain. And I'm British and that's my, my English, obviously inflected with American influences, Australian influences, but I speak British English. And I was doing the, I was hired by a British publisher. So I create, I did my ostensibly British translation, but trying not to do too many words that were clearly kind of very British. So I tried to neutralize it a little bit, but then, um, uh, then someone Americanized it. So then there was a kind of Americanization process from an external editor. Um, and that was beautiful to do because I learned a lot and I was able to say, oh no, in British, that doesn't mean that. I should, what, what I hope Fernanda means is this. So it was a really, um, yeah, it kind of expanded my own English and I allowed it to. And when it came to thinking like, how do I create an English Veracruz slang or vernacular? I so said, this is impossible because this book is so much about the ferocity and the fluency and the kind of almost like effortless way in which these people swear, like cuss each other. And how also how that interacts with some of the very literary, beautiful, um, careful and actually quite high register language that Fernanda uses as well so there's this lovely bridging of the two things and so I just said look you can't you can't create a Veracruz vernacular in English so just focus on each individual voice and say okay I want them to be idiolects I want to make sure that Chabela has a voice I want to make sure that Munra has a voice I want to make sure so I hope that in a way they all sound like different people even though they're not speaking in the first person, it, you get the free and direct discourse. So again, that created almost another problem, but yeah, it was, it was a huge challenge. Uh, it felt like an enormous responsibility and it was terrifying, but it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Um, yeah, I love uh, when we were talking before, you were saying about uh, translating, like when you're translating, you can actually hear it in your head. And I felt like, when I was reading the book in English, well, both in English and in Spanish, they're very, very different books, but I could really hear the kind of music and the rhythm and the cadence of each character's voice. Um, so yeah, no, it's really amazing. Um, I want to ask as well, Fernanda, um, the use of this um, very colloquial language, it kind of makes you feel as if you're, very close to the characters it's almost as if you're sitting with them at the bar and they're telling you all the gossip over a few beers and you know you, you want to know what's happening happening next because it's this this kind of storytelling where it's like yeah and then this happened and and so on um and like what what does it do to to make the voices so close in that way um is it, uh, yeah, does it, does it kind of slightly blur the, the line between good and evil? Is that, is that a strange question to ask? Because it feels like almost like I can understand this person, almost like we're the same somehow. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the, uh, my main objectives, if we, could talk about objectives when we we when we write a novel was to put the reader in the skin of of the characters right because i i think i wanted to understand why, how it is so easy in mexico to be a woman and get killed for nothing you know and and nothing happens you know you get no justice you get no um uh nothing at all you know just just like end up and ends up being gossip uh in the town yeah. and i i just needed to understand and and understand is not always to judge you know i think for me it was very difficult to 
put myself in a, as a narrator, to put myself in the position to be objective, you know, like, like in trying to uh, register what happens and also to be empathic with the, with the characters. And language, uh, as you well put it, uh, a, a colloquial language, uh, internal language, with these marks of, uh, you know, even the, the thinking process of the, of the characters, this, uh, uh, this uh, stream of conscious that, that we follow. Uh, some, some, some critic even said that it's not internal monologue, but external monologue, because it's like, you know, the character is always talking to somebody, telling, mm -hmm. no? And, and I think uh, um, uh, for me, it was uh, reading uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez helped me a lot to find this narrative voice that was able to be outside and inside the characters, you know, as, as it was convenient uh, for me and for the story. And basically, I just wanted to understand. And, and to understand, you cannot be outside in a position to just judge, but you have to understand the... the, the, the you know, even uh, it was very difficult for me because uh, when I'm thinking, for example, in um, the, the justifications that uh, 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 Norma's stepdad had to abuse her, for example, they are monstrous and horrendous, you know, but to him it makes sense. Yeah. So it was very difficult to write. And also uh, uh, the, the willingness of Norma to... Uh, submit herself to this abuse also it's so sad you know and 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 it breaks your heart but at the same time you get to know why uh, uh, she she agrees you know uh, uh, and and this quest of love you know this desperate quest of love and for me it was the only way to to show like the 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 reverse side of the of a murder uh, when I when I read this uh, newspaper story, I only saw the consequences. You know what happened, and you know a, a person was murdered, and two two guys end up in jail. Uh, but I wanted to write the other side, the, the other side that journalism almost never uh, 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 takes takes in, in, in. You know, and uh, it was it was an an. an uh, there is a pathetism that I always wanted to show because for me, mainly everything that happens in 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 hurricane season is about lack of love, you know. But you will never say that it's a it's an, a, a a love novel, you know. But but it is in fact. And in Spanish, the word love is is completely erased and and effaced from the from the novel deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I wanted to show the consequences of of, of this lack of love. I think it takes a lot of heart, doesn't it, to 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 show how monstrous people who are, for the most part, de de like shown to us as monstrous. Uh, I think it takes a lot of heart for an author to to be willing to tap into that other side, and especially with the internal monologue, where you really have to, for a while exist in their minds or try to. Um, and the authenticity of that, is extraordinary. I mean, you, it's hard to know whether Fernando is the person with the biggest heart or the most monstrous person you've ever, or ever met or translated. Because it's, <laughs> it's scarily authentic. It's yeah, it's it's yeah. scarily compelling and believable. Yeah. But it's also, to to my mind, that an act of enormous generosity to write a book that shows us how monsters are made. Because anyone who's ever had ever, any interaction whatsoever with a child knows that children are not born monsters. Mm. And you need to know what happened to them and you need to know wh why. Um, and do you feel, Sophie, that as a translator, you also need to get into the character's skin as Fernanda was describing? I, I, I will never, because it's simply not the same act as, you know, creating a character from scratch, giving birth to a character, maybe for one of a better um, metaphor, but, I, and I don't have to do that, they're there on the page. But of course, I have to write the words and I have to write scenes that are of kind of d diabolical, unbearable violence. So I spent time with this book in a way that other people haven't. Lots of people say, I read it in a day, it's the most amazing book. Uh, 
but, but it'll take me a while before I can reread it. Um, and I had to keep rereading it. And I didn't ever not, not cry or not feel. And again, like, you know, I always reminded of Sarah Kane, who I read as a like a, 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 like a young student. And I remember reading Blasted and the, the kind of furore that that play caused in Britain because she was um, representing and, and portraying like horrific violence. And she was like, her response was always like, well, how violent are the things that go unspoken in, in the news? that we see, that we're fed every day. Like, is that not a kind of violence mm -hmm. to feed us in journalese, in this very kind of plain flat language? Um, these kinds of events as if they were just facts and that's the end of the story. Like, so it's lovely to hear Fernanda say, I wanted to show the other side of the coin and the beginning and the, like what well, you said it as well, the origins of this violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I always uh, feel like to uh, hug my translators because they have to spend quite a while in, in, in La Matosa, living in La Matosa and living with these uh, characters. And, and I, I mean, the story is, is, is you know, it's is so crude and so uh, filled with rage and, and, and awkward, but it also has these um, intense but brief moments of uh, tenderness, uh, brightness, uh, some other stuff that, of course, no, life is like that too. Mm -hmm. Even if you are in, in misery, you sometimes uh, I don't know, look at the, at the way uh, the, this, the sunlight uh, brights a tree and it, it's just a beautiful moment. But the truth is I, I, I felt really connected to Sophie now because uh, she was in my head for a, for a little while. And she, I, I know, I, I always joke about this. I know she knows my deepest and darkest secrets now. I think I knew them the second that we were exchanging notes on, on the document and I remember we had this dilemma, it didn't last long because in the end we were like, okay, witch is fine. But I remember thinking, oh, witch, it has such such ambiguous connotations in, in Britain. Obviously we have a you know, fascinating history of witchcraft as well here. But I felt that in Mexico, because you still do go to see the village, so many people do, whether it's for a kind of tourism or whether they really believe it. Um, Whereas here, not so much. And so I was like worried about the word witch. And, and, and I just remember thinking, oh, Fernando and I are like in the same headspace, enough for me to do this book justice, because she said something like, yeah, not Melissa Hart Jones kind of witch. You know, like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're on the same wavelength. We're definitely gonna be fine. <laughs> and, and the book has so many funny moments as well that never get spoken about but actually for me the tenderness and the heart they are what I remember of the book yeah um, yeah no it's true um I wanted to also talk very briefly about the structure because we've been talking a lot about language and you know that's a really huge component of the book but this is also a book that's meticulously structured, the, the structure is so tight and the way that the voices kind of circle around the event and give us more and more information. And I think we actually have a, an image of Fernanda's uh, structuring. Yeah, there we go. Um, so <laughs> Fernanda, would you like to tell us about this? <laughs> well, sure. Uh, it's kind of a, like a chaos look in there, but it, well, you see there are lots of uh, small all notes just color it differently and each color is uh, a character or, or more than a character is a, a series of characters like um, uh, uh, characters that are inter intertwined uh, well um, with um, with uh, uh, in a same plot line to say I never use language like this it's, it's better to explain but I never when I'm doing a novel and I never use this kind of technical uh, language so uh, as you see there, they're like how things happen, things that happened and the uh, arrows you see or lines connecting is what happens first or what it is connected with what. And um, uh, in fact, I think there, there's, um, there's a whole line of characters that didn't uh, end in the book because, uh, well, that, that sort of thing happens and, and I, uh, I, I used to have another line of characters that uh, were the narrators that were telling a story that happened uh, a year before. And afterwards, I think I thought like, no, no, no. Uh, okay, a novel always ha has to start 
when the action begins, not a year before. That, that's that's a, a mistake. But you start thinking, you know, it's part of the process. It's mm -hmm. always, as David Lynch, the, the film director says, it's always, uh, you know, acting and reacting. You, you do something and then uh, the, the, the idea takes a better shape. And, and basically that's it. And, and there's even, I also marked um, what are like the uh, main uh, plot twists. Like, you know, these, these surprises that the novel is, is filled with. And it's always, you know, like, like ah, the way she's whatever. And, and I don't want to spoil it really. Yeah, uh, no spoiler. <laughs> and um, well, that's basically it. That's like the uh, first, uh, uh, before these uh, uh, omniscient, weird sort of uh, narrator existed, the, the, there was this structure to, to begin giving uh, shape and, and considering already uh, Louis Mee's uh, family, his, his cousins and, and Yesenia, of course, and, and all of the gang and the, the abuela, of course, the, the grandmother. And there's also Munra and Chabela, of course. And there's also, I think, uh, uh, of course, Luis Me and Norma and, and Norma's plotline. And it's, it's already, everything is, is there. It just really shows the, um, the incredible amount of detail you went into when imagining your fictional world for this, for this novel. It's really, it's really quite amazing. And, and it really shows when you're, when you're reading, it just feels so real. Um, I got to so say, it's translating it like it was, I had never seen this before, but I remember saying endlessly, you know, to people I was talked to about translating the book while translating it, I was like, there's not a word out of place. You know, as a translator, you do such a close reading that any mortal author will, you will find moments where there's maybe a slackness or maybe something hasn't quite added up or things get missed and not, you know, and they're not even mistakes. They're just part of what a novel is. But this, but this one was like, so, so tight. It was like, and people were like, it must've been so hard to translate. And I was like, well, in one, there were a few things to get my head around, but once I had, it was just joy and pleasure. And mm -hmm. like, because it was so well constructed and every sentence was so, it had obviously been read a hundred times by the author, mm -hmm. you know, whilst also seeming effortless. Yeah, I just I think I just put a lot of effort because, um, you know, this 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 is my second novel. This this was my my second novel, and and the first one is all is always you know I, I was when I began writing Falsa Liebre I was twenty seven twenty eight years old, and and it was you know like like I wanted to prove that I was a writer. I wanted to prove that I could make a, a do a create a story that maybe it wasn't going to be the best book ever, but, uh, you know, a very decorous uh, book. That, that's the thing I, I, I think you have to aim when you are your aspiring writer. And then with Hurricane Season, I, I did want to prove something, no? But, but it was to myself, mostly. Uh, nobody was expecting that novel. I was basically, you know, no, nobody. Now I'm being called, uh, you know, one of the uh, best represented uh, writers from Mexico. But at that time, in 2015, when I began writing uh, Hurricane Season, uh, nobody was expecting that novel. So I got the chance to take the, as, as much time as I needed to correct each word. It, it, it's just like Sophie said, uh, I, I think I corrected from beginning to end like 12 times, you know, and, and least, it, always reading it out loud to hear how each word fell in the place that I wanted to 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 do it, and and it was uh, uh, for me a, a totally tour de force emotionally too. I I, I had to start therapy be, uh, after finishing the the book because it confronted me with a lot of uh, emotions that I wasn't ready to feel at that moment yet. So I, I'm really glad that it's going that that is doing well, you know, because there's lots of work and lots of heart behind its uh, its writing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, Fernanda, if, if you would be willing to read uh, a little bit and then we could also get the, the English version um, of this particular section that we chose. Sure, I I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of the Spanish version. It's mm -hmm. just a tiny, I was going to say paragraph, but that doesn't exist in this novel. <laughs> so. 
uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's uh, oh my god, it's chapter four, maybe four. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, pasó de largo sin detenerse y giró en el retorno y entró a la gasolinera y sacó su teléfono celular y procedió a pulsar el mensaje más crudo y dolido y lleno de odio y encono que jamás antes su nombre le dedicó a su mujer. Un mensaje terrible que le haría cagarse y mearse y llorar de arrepentimiento por haberlo tratado de esa manera. Pero antes de que pudiera enviarlo, el aparato zumbó entre sus manos y él casi lo deja caer al suelo de la camioneta por la sorpresa. Y por un segundo pensó que se trataba de Chabela, pero era solo un mensaje del pinche chamaco, un mensaje que decía... ¿Qué pedo? Vamos a seguir chupando. Al que el Munra respondió, ¿Dónde estás? Y a su vez el chamaco, en el parque de Villa. Munra miró el indicador del combustible y pensó que lo más sensato sería regresar a la matosa y pedirle fiado a doña Concha un litro de caña y chupárselo entero en la cama mientras esperaba el regreso de Chabela hasta perder la conciencia o morir, lo que sucediera primero. He drove on without stopping made a U-turn, pulled up at the petrol station and took out his phone to type as vulgar, scathing, hate-filled and vindictive a message as a man ever wrote his wife. A truly terrible message that would make her shit herself, piss herself, weep with regret for having treated him that way. But before he could send it, the phone buzzed unexpectedly in his hands, nearly making him drop it to the floor of the van. And for a second, he thought it might be Trip Jabella, but it was just the kid a message that went, another round, come on, to which Mama replied, where are you? And the kid, Via Park. Mama looked at the fuel gauge and thought that the most sensible thing would be to drive back to La Matosa and ask Doña Concha to put a litre of aguardiente on his tab and drink the whole thing in bed while he waited for Javela to get home. Drink until he passed out or died, whichever happened first. And just then his telephone buzzed again. And once again, it was the kid now telling him that he'd got hold of some cash, that he'd spot Munra's petrol if he did him this one solid of taking him to a job, by which the witness understood that his stepson had required the services of taking him to a specified location where he could obtain the money to continue drinking, a proposal the witness accepted, meaning that inside his closed-top Lumina van, color gray-blue, model 1991, with vehicle registration plates from the state of Texas, Roger Golf X-Ray 511, he drove to the agreed-upon meeting point, namely a row of benches in the park facing the Palacio Municipal de Villa, where he met his stepson, who was accompanied by two subjects, one of whom was known by the nickname of Willie. Occupation VHS retailer in Villa, Villa Market, roughly 35 to 40 years of age, long black graying hair, dressed in his customary rock band t-shirt and black combat boots, often referred to as co tapped boots. And the other person was a young man about whom the witness knew nothing, apart from that he went by the name of Brando, although he was unsure if that was his surname or given name. Roughly 18 years of age, a slim build, black eyes, short black spiky hair, light skinned, wearing brown shorts and a Manchester United shirt, bearing Chicharito's number on the back. And finally, there was his stepson. The witness spent approximately two hours in the company of these three men in the aforementioned public space, during which time they imbibed several litres of an orange flavoured drink with aguardiente that the young man nicknamed Brando had bought with him pre-mixed in a gallon plastic tankard, in addition to a marijuana cigarette. And together they, namely Luis Mi, Brando and Willie, also consumed psychotropic pills, the make or type of which the witness does not know, until two in the afternoon, at which point his stepson asked if he was gonna do him that solid. And I told him I was out of petrol, that he had to give me the money first. And that's when I tweaked that the one with the ready was Brando because he handed me a 50 and said, take us to La Matosa. And I said, 100 and you've got yourself a deal. And Brando said, 50 now, 50 later. And I agreed and we left. Everyone except Willie who passed out on the park bench and didn't see us pile into the van and head for the petrol station where I put the 50 pesos worth in and then drove towards La Matosa along the main drag on Brando's instructions, before a right down turn round the track that leads to the mill. Only then did I realise that the boys were leading me to the house of the person known as the witch, and I wasn't happy about this because I don't like hanging around those parts, mainly because of the things people say about that place and the things that go on in there. But I kept my mouth shut because I knew they were just going to ask for money and wouldn't stay long. It was an in and out job, and I could wait in the van, and then we'd all be able to carry on drinking. 
Thank you so much. Um, just very briefly, we're about to run out of time. We have so much to talk about in, with this novel, but Fernanda, could you explain a little bit about how that section moves? You know, all of that section is one sentence, but we have third person, then we go into the witnesses account, and then we go into first person and how it's kind of going in and out. Um, could you tell us about, about that? Yeah, sure. I, I... I never read out loud this part, and I think it's it's a really nice pick, you know, a, a really great uh, uh, epic because uh, it shows like the different kind of uh, discourses that are intertwined in in, in hurricane season. And I, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in in those months and years reading. Um, I don't know how to say this in English, uh, like the declarations in a in a official. Uh, uh, like witness uh, statements and things. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's exactly. And and this it has this uh, weird language that uh, it's kind of a sort of part the declaration of the witness, and also it's the interpretation of the person who's taking you know like like the declaration. So mm -hmm. I I just love it, and I thought it was cool to to put it also in the novel so we can uh, understand that everything that's going through them through this voice the the, the inside the mind of uh, Munra is sort also of, of what he's telling uh, the police about it. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know, it was an experiment and I, and I, I love to hear it in English because I think it's, it, it, it worked uh, very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, I really love that section. It, it's one of my favorite. Um, and it's just so amazing the way you kind of weave, weave the voices around and each time it's almost like you're retelling the story but each time we hear it, there's another detail or the details from the path get called into question. And yeah, it's just so tight and so beautiful. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're about to run out of time now. So I'd like to thank you both for sharing about your process in such a generous way. Um, I really, really enjoyed talking to you both. And, and being here with you. And yeah, thank you to our audience as well. If you can, if you have the chance to please support our independent online bookshop at shop.edbookfest.co.uk, which is now live and where audiences can buy all relevant titles and many more. And this year's festival program is free of charge for everyone and has been made possible by the generosity of supporters of donors. So if you've enjoyed this event, we'd love you to consider making a donation to Edinburgh International Book Festival so they can continue their great work of putting on events for as many people as possible. So yeah, without further ado, uh, goodbye and thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Mm-hmm. <laughs>